Good morning. morning. I'd forget my head if it wasn't screwed on. They are. All right. (coughs) Well, we just partook of communion. We just prayed. Let's get right into the word for this morning. One of the things that we sometimes nonchalantly pass by in our minds, if nothing else, especially if we listen to much of what's out there in the so-called Christian world, the so-called church. And we tend, because of that, to, to treat our Lord and Savior uh, just sort of nonchalantly. You know, yeah, he was a Savior and he died on the cross and, and, and we sort of let it be at that. And, and I want to remind all, all of us that Jesus is much more than that. Salvation itself is much more than that. He has a lot to say in his intro here in chapter 1, Apostle Paul. But let's skip down to verse 10 and following. He's praying for them and he loves them all, etc. He doesn't cease to pray for them. And he says, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. This whole increase in the knowledge of God, never forget, is a command of God. In John 15, we find out in no uncertain terms that if we don't grow in the Lord, we might just be a branch that gets broken off. Because that scripture is clear. It's, I am the vine and you are the branches. The branches is not works, as some people try to claim. You are the branch. And so here we have (coughs) a clear indication that we are to increase in the knowledge of God. If you know more about God today than you did yesterday or last week or last month or last year, that's a wonderful thing. How much you gain in the knowledge of God is not necessarily the important thing. Is that you gain more knowledge of God. Okay, you have to grow in the Lord. That's what it means to grow in the Lord. It doesn't mean to get more spiritual, you know, and, and to talk differently and to pray, or oh, thou Lord, thou us doeth, you know, all this kind of stuff. People think that that kind of stuff is growing in the Lord, and it just isn't. Just be real with God, everybody. Be real with the Lord. He knows you. He made you. And the best way... To find out is to read his word, because this is, this is the Yeshua Logos, the written salvation, the written Jesus. All right, verse 11, he goes on, so in the increase in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the, in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He's delivered us from the world system, the Antichrist system in which we are living, and He's delivered us into the system of the church. This is why the church needs to hang out. This is why the church needs to pray for one another like never before. This is why the church is the only real body of believers on earth that has any hope at all. There is zero hope for the world. Zero hope. Except they repent. Except they repent. Remember, (coughs) the scriptures are clear that while God died, Jesus rather, (coughs) died for everybody. He didn't just die for everybody. He died for each and everybody. Please get this difference. He died for each individual. That is not the same as to say that he loves each individual like it's out there. We read in John uh, a few weeks ago how Jesus said, if you obey my words, then I love you. And it is you that loves me if you obey me. So obedience is a clear indicator of loving him. In fact, it's the indicator. And then he went on to say, and then when that happens, my father will love you. And I told you that in the Greek, that is my father will love him and only him who loves and obeys the Lord. 
Please understand that God died for everybody, each individual. He wants a relationship with everybody on planet Earth, but he's not getting it, is he? And he loves those who love him. Hallelujah. Look at this thing about Christ. Father qualifies us to be partakers. He said, this is what I'll do. If you accept what my son did on the cross, I'll accept you. I love you. I'll carry you through all the way to the end, and I'll give you a glorious resurrection. Hallelujah. I can't wait. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. You don't have to sin anymore. None of you. I don't have to sin anymore. And then there are those who say, because that's a fact, we can be sinless. Well, that's not true. Because guess what? I bet you all of you sinned not too long ago. Somehow. And of course, I would include myself. They call this present possession of salvation by the believer <coughs> realized eschatology. And they call those who think they're sinless, and there are those out there. We have some friends who unfortunately fell into that false teaching. They really believe they're sinless. That's called over-realized eschatology for a good reason. It's obviously over-realized. <laughs> <laughs> it's not real. So the whole point here, I want to get to, to Christ and what Paul says about him in several places, but we'll start here in Colossians. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of, his, of the Son of His love, which is a church on earth, the invisible church that is, all true believers, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Verse 15, he, Christ, is the icon in the Greek. He's the image, the picture, and the likeness of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Wow. Jesus is not some dude who did nice things and who gave his life on a cross selflessly. Unfortunately, that's where a lot of people are. They call themselves brothers and sisters of ours. That's not even anywhere near close. That's a new age mentality of Christ. One of them, they have many, obviously. See, when you're talking about the Christ spirit, they go into the universal thing. The universe, the universe did this for me. When you're talking about the person of Christ to a new ager, they will say, well, yeah, he was some, some hippie dude with long hair and sandals, and, and he came against the government, he was a rebel, etc., etc. He didn't really come against the government of Rome at all. He wasn't even political. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. <laughs> what he came against was the evil established system of religiosity. You, Pharisees of your father the devil, he said, and you do the works that he wants you to do. That's why you don't hear my words. You can't hear them because you don't know me. And you don't know me because you don't know him. I am the word made flesh. The father and the word are one. God and the word are one. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You can't separate the two. So we see that Jesus is the creator. He has power over thrones and dominions, principalities, any kind of government, in or outside of the world. Jesus is the head. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. <coughs> Are you there? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, to whom he also made the world. There it is again. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image, the express icon, 
the express picture, the express likeness of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power or his powerful word, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Roman Catholicism says Mary is co-redemptrix. What a blasphemous bunch of nonsense. Amen. This is not the only place where he's, where he's, uh, he's said to be the only Savior. Uh, Isaiah 45, 46, 47 talks about, I am the only Savior, the God of Israel. He has no co-redempt anything. He is the Savior. He is the Creator. Go to Ephesians 1.20. Backpedal a little bit. A couple of pages. We just read how he has power and dominion in all realms of existence. Eternity in time. On the earth, under the earth, around the earth. Wherever there is powers and principalities. Wherever there is living beings that has been given life by God who is life. Jesus Christ is the head. He's not some hippie dude who rebelled and who died for some say your sins. He is the Savior of all mankind. <coughs> if anyone is going to get saved, they have to come through Christ himself. Verse 20 says, uh, <coughs> well, let's start in 19. Now, nah, let's not do that. Let's start in 15 and go down. Are you with me? Yeah. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and, you lo and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him that will be Christ. Notice how many times, and if you go through the rest of the New Testament and even the Old, it's always about knowledge of God. Have knowledge of God. In the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe. In other words, not toward those who don't believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, far above Obama, far above Putin, far above Merkel, far above Hollande, far above all these people. Far above the devil himself, who is a liar and a loser. We're talking about Christ Jesus, the one who sits at the right hand of God. I'm about to get happy. Ow! And he put all things, verse 22, under his feet, under Christ's feet, and gave him, Christ, to be the head over all things in the church. Which is, his <coughs> excuse me, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And he talks about how he made us alive, etc. Back to uh, Colossians, please. You realize that you're the body of Christ? Some of you may be his hand, some of you may be his foot, some of you may be his shoulder, his elbow, his knee, his rib. None of us are the head because he alone is the head. And isn't that good? Look at verse 12 of chapter 2. Whoops, sorry. <coughs> chapter 1, <coughs> verse 17. Still talking about Christ. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. The book we just left, Ephesians, is known for in him. The whole point about Ephesians is in him saying how Christ is preeminent over everything and everybody. And, and, and Christ has been watered down. He's watered down in the so-called Christmas. He's watered down in, in church from church pulpits. He's watered down in the hearts and minds of men and women who say they're Christians. He's watered down. I can't take it. Am I ranting and raving for nothing? No. no. 
Because it's true and we need to be diligent and vigilant concerning what you and I believe about Christ. Inasmuch as he died for each individual personally in hopes to have a relationship with that person because that's his desire. The Bible tells us clearly that God wishes that all would come to the knowledge of him and get saved. But are all coming? No. In fact, what else does the Bible say? That the gate's narrow. Few there be that find it. Some people see a contradiction. There's no contradiction at all. It's just stating facts. Because of the sin of mankind, and this is why there'll never be peace on earth, there'll never be a peace contract that's worth anything between anybody. Why? Because of S-I-N. As long as sin is in the world, sin in the human heart and mind, there will never be true peace. You'll always have somebody wanting somebody else's stuff. And that's why it takes Christ to come, put an end to all that nonsense, rule with an iron rod, hallelujah. I can't wait. Not because of the harshness of it, but because things will be set right. Things will be set right. And little ones like that and all the other little ones can grow up in a world where things are right. And when things aren't right, they'll be set right immediately, if not sooner, because you can't, you can't hide anything from God. You can't have a backdoor meeting with the judges and the lawyers and come up with a deal. That's the world I'm waiting for. And he's before all things. <coughs> Excuse me. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things you may have the preeminence. That firstborn is in rank. The Jehovah's Witnesses say, no, that firstborn means he was created first. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Greek says. So Jehovah's Witnesses are basically pagan twits. They are liars. They're not going to make it unless they repent and come to the truth. Just like the Mormons and the Muslims and the Roman Catholics and etc., etc., so much effort is put forth by the world and all these people to have these national days of prayer and everybody meets and everybody prays with everybody. Can you imagine Elijah praying with the prophets of Baal? Can you imagine Paul, Peter, James, John, etc. praying with any of those pagans of their day? Are you kidding me? And he's the head of the body of the church who is the beginning of the firstborn. 19, for he pleased the Father that in all things all the fullness should dwell. Wow. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By Christ to reconcile things to the Father. By him whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood. In Luke 2.14 we have the angels announcing to the shepherds the birth of Christ, and they say, peace on earth, goodwill toward man. And the world, of course, and many churches have taken that and talked like, oh, they want to, oh, yes, peace. You know, and the United Nations has their thing about the plow, you know, plowshares be turned, or swords be turned into plowshares, etc. All this biblical stuff and all of it is perverted. <laughs> there is no peace with men among men. This says there's peace between God and men. And in 2.14 <coughs> of Luke, the Greek says, Peace uh, between God and men on whom God's favor rests. They should have added that in the English and they didn't. With whom he is well pleased is another way to say it. God only is well pleased with those who believe in him and his word. Yeah, nobody else. We felt, how many times have I told you, God hates the sinner with a passion. Well, we got scriptures to back that up, don't we? Yet the world says, oh no, he loves you. He's not mad at you. And the scripture says he's mad with the sinner every single day. Why don't people teach that? Why don't preachers get up and tell the truth? See, the beauty of it is, and the love of God says that, yeah, I can't possibly love you because you're against me. But if you turn to me, you're all mine. And I love you like I do everybody else. But that concept is totally gone in the minds of people. It irketh me big time. 
so uh, we do what we can to put this out on the internet and uh, there's only a few people checking it out but for all I know that's between God and them God's responsible to get it out there we can we do what we do just a quick side note I just have to say it you know she asked me two or three years ago do I want to be on this pastors network thing and I went on there and I looked at these idiotic questions from pastors that have nothing to do with scripture really or salvation or anything else and I got on there and I said a few things and then I came onto some things and boy did I get get hit by everybody only one guy said you know Walt had something to say one guy Everybody else ignored all the scriptures I gave to back out what I said. They didn't even go there. And that's what many people do. You guys are responsible to know the word. I'm responsible to know the word. And you're responsible to know enough about the word that when I speak of it, you need to say, yeah, that's right. Or, you know, let's talk about it. Or exactly how did you get to that? You know what I mean? That kind of thing. You need to be discerning about, <coughs> excuse me, about it. <laughs> But people go, how many churches people go in without a Bible? They don't need one. Because they just listen to the guy up there and waiting for lunchtime. When's the race starting, you know, whatever. I mean, it's just, it's just appalling. I know that you guys aren't like that. But I got to remind you that everybody around you is. Okay? And I hate to say it, especially organized religions. Evangelical or not doesn't make any difference. You've got to be very careful. Because once you get organized, you have a business to run. Once you have a business to run, what always takes precedence? Buckaroos. Because you have to have it. So he made peace. God made peace with man through the cross of Christ. And he's at peace only with those on whom his favor rests with whom he is well pleased. Does that make sense to you? Well, yeah. How many of you are well pleased with all your children that go against you and cause havoc? <laughs> that doesn't mean you wouldn't take them back as soon as they repent. Of course you do, because love is in place. But the point is, you can't go to that other place because of sin. Man, Sin is messing things up, isn't it? Selfishness, sin, pride. And he tells them, you who were once alienated, you Colossians, you were away from God, you know, and you, you were enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed, and that if, I've heard the television, or uh, well, yeah, that too, but radio preachers say, you can just use sense. No, you can't. Not if you study the Greek. You know, if has four basic meanings. But it's much, 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 much deeper than that that I'm here to tell you I don't really get it. It's so, you have to really want to know the Greek language, and biblical Greek at that, which is Alexander the Great's invention. The way Luther, he did the same thing that Luther ended up doing for the German language. It was messed up, all these different dialects, and, and Luther said, bang, that's it, here's what we're going to do. And when he translated the scriptures, that's what was adopted from that time on. Yeah, there's different dialects still, but the point is, it's all more or less one, okay? It makes sense. And so, <clears throat> so if the best word, the best way to, to describe it in this particular scripture is provided that, not since. Paul never states in all the if statements Paul gives in all his letters, he never says yes or no to any one of them. He's, he always leaves it open. Okay? And it's always you personally. So, to above reproach in his sight, if, or provided that, you continue in the faith. How are we saved? By grace? Are we saved by grace? Yes. No. Faith. If we were saved by grace, everybody would be saved. <laughs> we're saved by grace through faith. Never forget that. The grace alone without faith 
has no power. It has no job. Grace only has a job when it's received by faith. The desire for a personal relationship with the Lord. That's why grace is put out to everybody. But everybody doesn't receive it. Now listen to this. I love it. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. There are those who say, oh, you can't ever be moved away. You know, once you're in, you're in. Well, he says, stay there unless you're moved away. Unless you, somebody pulls you away from it. Not moved from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Wow. No, there's no ant, no bird, no lion, no dog, no cat that doesn't know the gospel. No, gra no you know, blade of grass, no tree. Everybody knows their creator. Even human beings. It's just that we deny him. Well, we don't. But the majority out there do. Remember, there's only one of two choices. Either God created us, like the Bible says, or we created ourselves. There is no third option. There's no third option, no matter how you look at it. And knowing myself and how powerless I am, which was recently <laughs> demonstrated in no uncertain terms with that gallbladder attack, I got no power for nothing. <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> God's going to have to do it. Therefore, God created me. I rejoice in my sufferings, Paul says, for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. It's always about the church, building up the church. And he goes on. <coughs> of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. So he goes and he tells us how great Christ is. He's the creator. Everything's about him, for him, through him. And now he says, here's why I do this. Not only is everything about for and through Christ, but I do it for his body now, the church. I want his body to be healthy. I don't want there to be any broken bones, any sickness and disease in the body. And I'm not talking about physical sickness and disease. We all know that Christians die every day of all kinds of cancers and everything else. Of course, God can and does work, but not in the way it's taught by the TV preachers. The mystery which has been hidden, verse 26, from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known. To them, the saints, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. The expectation, the earnest expectation that we will be saved too. It's not just the Jews. All can come to him. Didn't Christ say he had two flocks? He told the Jews, I got another flock. You guys don't know anything about him. He was talking about the Gentiles. He was talking about the church. And I got to put you both in the same corral, which is the church. We have Jews and Gentiles. The first 150, 200 years of the early church were mainly Jews anyway. It wasn't until the third century that Gentiles became the, the majority in the church. Yeah. People, people forget that. <coughs> 28. <coughs> now listen to this. You tell me if this is done by most preachers in the world. Look at 28. Him we preach. Warning. Every man. And teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. I try to warn a lot. Even to those of you who are saved. We need to continually be reminded how evil the world is. How awesome Christ is and his salvation. And how, we, how much we need him. How we cannot do anything on our own. We are completely and totally worthless and powerless. God says... The, uh, the Psalms say that God considers the nations uh, as nothing and the individuals in the nations as nothing and worthless. 
explain that one to a, oh, God, just love you. Look, we never understand God. We talked earlier about how we got to have the knowledge of God has to increase. How can it increase if all you got is a Mickey Mouse a mentality of God? How can it increase? You might add Goofy and Minnie and some of that, but you're not going to get to the Christ, the one with whom you have a relationship, or you should have a relationship, and I know you guys do. So him we preach, warning. What's he warning? What's, wait a minute, Christ is love. Christ died on the cross. What's the warning about? The warning is to miss it. Go with me to Hebrews 10. If somebody tramples Christ underfoot, are you in Hebrews 10? Yes. Verse 29, of how much, well, for, let's start in 28. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. No one's going to boo-hoo for these people. They just die, and they're not going to heaven early. <laughs> they just die. They go to the grave, the very thing that Christ paid for you not to go to, death, hell, and the grave. So anyone dies Moses' law, anyone who has rejected Moses. Verse 29, <coughs> after that knowledge that he just gave us in 28, he says, the writer of Hebrews, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified or set apart a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. Wow. And this thought of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy? Well, who's thinking that? Well, God is. You can't take my word and trample on it and make it to heaven. You can't expect my love to pour out. Being love, I've already put it out. I've already said you can come free of charge, all of you. But until you come, you got nothing. You're going one direction, that's to the lake of fire. See, that's what this is back in Colossians. Him we preach, warning. What did Paul say at the Areopagus? All these scholars and all these religious guys and all the philosophers, the lovers of Sophia, lovers of knowledge. The first thing he said was, God appointed the day. And what did he say about that day? He said, because that day he appointed is to judge all mankind. There's your warning. So Paul did what he preached, didn't he? Him we preach warning every man, everyone that God put you in, put you in front of. And then if they're willing, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man <coughs> perfect in Christ Jesus. Notice in Christ Jesus. Remember, Christ Jesus is him in heaven. Jesus Christ is him on earth. The anointed Savior is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Like an official court scene. The right hand, that's why you give the right hand, you know, of uh, reconciliation or whatever. It refers to an official act. Okay? <clears throat> and then Paul says, 29, To this I also labor, striving according to his work, which works in me mightily. Let's go a little bit into a two here. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. Now he brings in Laodicea, the last church in Revelation. Laodicea means ruled by the people, or the people choose. Don't we have Laodicea? Creeping up more and more prominent today? Yeah. People are choosing which Christ they want. The Mickey Mouse Christ or the real Christ. And they're choosing the Mickey Mouse Christ because that Christ doesn't punish you. That Christ, you can do whatever you want. I don't know if that Christ wears the ears, but he might as well. <clears throat> so 
So he talks about Laodicea here. It's very interesting. For as many, and also for as many have not even seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be what? Encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. It's the understanding. This is why Paul preached in the, in the so-called uh, pastoral epistles in First and Second Timothy, out of the 18 or 19 times that doctrine is mentioned in all of the New Testament, 16 take place in Timothy. He said, Timothy, guess what? It's about doctrine and doctrine and doctrine and doctrine and doctrine and nothing else. This doctrine right here, the one you've heard, the one that, you know, your grandma Chloe and all that, that's the doctrine, the one you believe, the one that saves your soul, that's the doctrine. Da, 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 da. What do people say today? I've heard Paul Crouch with my own ears on TV saying, Oh, you ought to, you know, I'm mad at you guys and with all your doctrinal doo-doo. Just like that. Talking about Dave Hunt and others who were, who were saying to him, you know, yeah, you got this powerful TV station, millions and millions and millions of viewers, and you got liars like Benny Hinn on there and others, and you yourself are a liar. What's up with that? Why don't you reconcile what you say with the scriptures? Well, they don't want to do that. They just wanted to, you know... Uh, slam, slam uh, Dave Hunt and others. And yes, there are a lot of apologists who are whacked out, just like, uh, you know, you go on the internet and you see all this uh, conspiracy nonsense. Of course there's a conspiracy. Satan is the main conspirator, First John 5, 19. We know we're of God, but the whole world lies where? Under the sway of the wicked one. How is that not a conspiracy? And a conspiracy is only a long-term business plan. Think of it like that. We were watching a movie yesterday, and the guy said it was a military thing about Afghanistan and, and some uh, uh, Canadian troops who were there. And <coughs> one of the sayings the Afghans supposedly have <coughs> excuse me, in this movie came out saying, you, uh, you, you Westerners, you may have uh, the watch and the clock, but we have the time. Meaning we don't care how long it takes. You're never going to overtake us, we're going to fight you and 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 fight you because we're Afghans and we're not going to be taken by you. See, Russia was there seven, eight years and lost. We're over there messing around. It's all for the poppy and the drug trade and the oil, etc. That's why we're there. We're not there to save Afghans. We're not there to, you know, make anybody's life better. We're there to control. Remember that America is nothing more than an idea. And when you really study it out, it ain't a good one. It's about greed from day one. And the ones who are caught in the middle is everyday Americans who are decent people. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, it's a shame, folks. And then they want to bring religion into it and bring the word into it and act like everybody is all Christian. I want to finish with this. <coughs> Uh, verse 3, chapter 2, talking about Christ, both of the Father and of Christ. Their hearts will be encouraged. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. This is one of our scriptures from, uh, for the uh, uh, apologetic ministry. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. See, again, I want to point out, they couldn't have received Jesus Christ as such. I mean, it's the same, okay, but technically speaking, they received Christ Jesus. Why? He's already in heaven. You understand? Woo! You and I receive Christ Jesus, because He's in heaven. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Wow. Verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, in the trust in Him, that is, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. 8. He repeats what He said in 4. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy or lover of wisdom and empty yourself, or empty deceit rather, according to the tradition of men, 
according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are completed in him who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. <coughs> you and I are spiritually circumcised when we quit sinning. That's what this says. And in Christ, of course, it's already done. Buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him. How? Through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. I love it. So we have these serious warnings twice, just a couple of verses apart. Don't let anyone cheat you through philosophy or some vain deceit. It's like the courts today. You know, the courts say, really say, we don't care about justice. We care about the law. Well, technically, the law should be a just law that's derived from God, from the Ten Commandments. God says, this is right, this is wrong. But we don't have that today. I mean, the law that homosexuality is now a national you know, pastime in America via the Supreme Court, is that just? No, it's a perversion. Flat and simple. It's a total perversion. Yet, it's the law. It's the same as when Hitler said Jews are no longer humans. They actually passed the law. So if you want to spit on them, beat them up, hang them from a lamppost, go ahead. Yeah, it's the law, but it's not just. And you and I and the justice that we have in our minds come from God and only from God. If it ain't from God, it ain't just anyway. Or well, it isn't just anyway. She hates it when I say ain't. <laughs> <coughs> so all my ranting and raving up here was designed to, uh, and I pray, you know, the Lord that he would uh, let everyone who needs to know it, that he would take care of that because he's going to have to, not me. What I say really is neither here nor there. What anyone says is neither here nor there. It's how God puts it in your hearts. And the way it is in my heart is we're in trouble as far as the world is concerned. They're in trouble. We're living in an antichrist system ever since the fall. And it's been building, 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 building. Got up to the Tower of Babel. God just, you know, destroys the languages and changes it all up. So that whole thing fell down. Then we go through all the kingdoms and we go through the, you know, Daniel's vision. <coughs> or rather Nebuchadnezzar's vision, Daniel's interpretation, all those kingdoms, and many other kingdoms that aren't even mentioned. You know, in America, we have the Incas, the Aztecs, etc. We have Attila the Hun. We have all these guys who had great empires. And it was all to do what? One thing, to bring the world together, to have a one world government, one world religion. Okay? One world court system, as it were. And we're almost there with Europe leading the pack. Many people can't figure it out, but Central Europe, Germany, is the middle of this thing, this revived Roman Empire. And economically, they're doing better than anybody, and they they're still are. I'm reading reports how even, even the experts don't know what, what the deal is. They keep growing in numbers and, and, and so forth and so on. With all these refugees, they took over a million, two or three, refu point two or three ref uh, refugees last year. And... Uh, and, the, and some reports are now saying that that's actually going to make money for Germany. <laughs> First it's going to cost them, then it's, you know, no, never know what to believe there. But anyway, the world's ate up with Satan and his lies. You and I got to stay on top of it. It's not enough to know, oh, yeah, I was saved since 1919. I'm fine. I'm going to heaven. I'm fine. That's not enough. Not in this world. Not now. There are many who say by 2017, that's just next year. The Obama administration, which is just, you know, one step further with all the rest, they're all evil, da 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 uh, has plans in play to chip every American. What's going to happen when you get a notice saying, you know, you have, you know, date XYZ, you choose the date, you know, get your chip. I'm going to have to say, I'm not getting the chip. Well, then we'll have to close all your accounts. We'll have to 
shut off your electricity, you know, you know all this kind of, this is what's coming, folks. This is how they pressure you into it. If we're not as far away, or if we're not, <coughs> if we're not as far along where we are, and the clearer we are, remember I talked a couple Sundays ago about uh, doing away with cash. All these countries are doing away with cash. 2.7% of the population in Denmark uses cash. 2.7%, hardly anybody. And it's only 22% or something in the United States. Over 80 per, or over 70, 8, 9% already don't use cash. You know, we talked about this. Everything's credit or some sort of electronic deal. Cash is basically already gone. But the 10 bucks you have in your pocket, you can still give to somebody and no one controls it. And Satan can't have that. He must also control that. Because until he controls that, then somebody can buy and somebody can sell. You understand? He needs to control it so that you can't buy or sell without this or this. So when you give your change, if it's still there, you got to also do that. Man, it's so close, guys. It's so close. Uh, all these heads, I've told you, I just want to repeat it quickly, then we'll pray out. All these heads of state are saying, we've got to get rid of cash, we've got to get rid of cash. And they're saying it for national security. We're going to, boy, that's really going to nip it in the bud for the, all the drug guys because they won't be able to, you know, launder their money. There's nothing to launder, this kind of thing. Once it's in the electronics, <laughs> look at the cheating going on now. <laughs> Deutsche Bank says they're getting rid of 30,000 plus clients because they were all criminals. The outfit that came out with this, uh, the Panama Papers is closing the doors in their three main offices I read the other day. Well, you know they're not going out of business. They're just changing address. How are they going to go out of business? It's a multi-billion dollar business. You think anyone in the world that's not saved, especially, is going to say, oh yeah, I don't need that anymore. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> Too much power. It's power centers that these guys are after. Satan needs every power center. He needs the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts. He needs governments. He needs courts. He needs school systems. He needs universities. He needs ball teams. Those are power centers. And that's what these, this money is buying for these people. Never forget it. Churches are bought. Billy Graham was bought and paid for. Back in the 40s and 50s, he was still good. In the 60s, he started thinking about it. In the 70s, it was pretty much too late. I like the guy. I can't find anything wrong with his preaching. But all his friends were evil people. And, he, and everything was paid for by, by the world, by the devil, basically. All his, his, uh, his very first uh, crusade, you know, like a week-long thing. It was all you know, popular and everything. Uh, it was all paid uh, by unsafe people because they needed him to get the evangelical vote see they needed him to get that you understand now you may like Billy Graham and you may not understand what I'm saying and all that you need to research it and when I brought this up to other pastors oh you can't mention him why not the church ought to know either he was lying or I'm lying and I'm not the only one this has been Dave Hunt <laughs> got so much flack for uh, saying so many things about Billy Graham, uh, people wouldn't invite him back and, and call him names and all the rest of it. And he's just one of many. Kathy Burns wrote a book this thick, Billy Graham and His Friends. I got through this much of it. I haven't touched it since. I've had it for probably seven, eight years, maybe longer. I couldn't take it anymore. But it's all documented. None of it was a slander. Bill Bright. Anybody know who Bill Bright is? These guys are passed away now, but Bill Bright was a, uh, uh, what's that? Campus Crusade. Yeah, Campus Crusade. You know, he had all these Christian groups and colleges and everything. He, he goes and he accepts a pagan award from pagans, had a million dollars or $500,000 attached to it. And, oh, thank you so much. I'm so honored. Da, da, da. I'm like, I want to puke. You can't do that when you're a man of God. You say, you know what, thanks for the offer, I don't want it, give it to somebody else, click. They didn't do that. Because many people think that, you know what, if I do this, you know, I know it's tough to get the word out, uh, but at least I get the word out. That's what people thought about, it. that's what I thought years ago, in the, in the very beginning, of <coughs> touched by an angel, totally evil, pagan, demonic show. I thought, well... They do mention God, you know, must be good. 
I mean, I've been there. Never mind that no angel is a female in the Bible. They're all males, every one of them. Never mind that they never really mention Jesus. And without Jesus, there's no salvation, there's no truth, there's no nothing. We just read it. In him, in him, in him, you see. We got to wake up, folks, and know what's around us. Paul said, look circumspectly and know what's going on around you. All right, enough of my ranting and raving for a while. Jill will hear the rest on the way home. <laughs> Are you glad you saved? Man, thank you, Father, for salvation. Thank you for your Son. You sent your word. You became flesh. You walked the earth and died a cruel death, Lord. And he did it all for us. He did it for that small remnant that will make it through that narrow gate by your very own words. Thank you that all of us are part of that small remnant. Forgive us our sins. Be with all the persecuted ones. And bring the peace to Jerusalem, Lord. Do it today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.